10 is here, here and we're up to electromagnetism lesson 10 DC motors and their different types so let's get into it DC motors and DC generators share much in common in actual fact they're quite interchangeable as Faraday discovered that's Michael Faraday in 1873 therefore paving the way for their development so in this lesson we're going to describe how each type performs when providing power to a load that's power to a mechanical load and we're going to do that firstly by looking at section 14.3 in the textbook types of DC motors and then 14.4 losses and efficiencies in DC motors so there are five basic types of DC motors the first is the permanent magnet DC motor you've probably encountered these in hobby toys like remote control cars boats slot cars those kinds of things separately excited DC motors very good when you want to control speed and torque shunt DC motors again they have special characteristics therefore can be used in particular applications series DC motors again have their own range of characteristics and then finally the compound motor which basically is a shunt and a series in combination that gives us our five permanent magnet separately excited shunt series and compound so these have an identical construction to their equivalences as generators and each type have certain characteristic that suit particular ways that you might apply them so let's start with our permanent magnet DC motor so let's start at the bottom of the drawing here with our armature so here's our, our armature core I'm just quickly drawing around the outside of the armature core I'll put a C on the commutator there's the commutator we've got bearings at either end and of course a shaft that transmits the mechanical energy to the outside world now this end of the armature assembly fits into a particular end cap where the lead in supply comes from and the brushes and you can see here here's our commutator around here and we've got brush holders literally normally little brass rectangular prisms which hold our brushes in place normally with a little spring on the top and then the brush sits on the inside so the brush is forced down onto the commutator you can see the lead-in wires there's the black one leading into the brush and the red one if you trace it through leading to the brush on the other side the commutator of course connected to the armature windings here they are going up into the armature itself so let's move now across to the magnets that form the field and we have the body of the motor or the frame normally made of a ferrous material because we want the magnetic field to be well transmitted around the outside but the two magnets here they are just a crescent shaped magnets being glued into the top and the bottom and obviously we want on one side a north and the other side a south so we end up with this fixed magnetic field crossing the space where the armature is going to sit and of course as the armature gets inserted into here and we pass some current through the armature then magnetic fields are built up around the armature they interact with the permanent magnetic field and we get rotational energy and the motor begins to spin so here's our finished motor on the right hand side the 
black frame. End cap with a bearing. Our sh shaft is going to provide the mechanical energy out. And you can see the wires just here in the background going to the commutator and assembly, which is hidden in here. So DC permanent magnet motors come in a wide variety and range of sizes, power ratings, etc. This one's a 370 watt motor and is used for powering small electrical utility vehicles. Maybe something like a golf buggy or a electric site vehicle for moving around a large industrial site. So how do we control this type of motor? Well, basically we can only control the speed. And the way we do that is we use a fixed DC supply and we want to manage the current. That's what we want to do. We want to manage the current through the armature because if we have a big current, we'll produce large magnetic fields in the armature which will interact with the field. Remember we've got a permanent magnet in here at the side, north and south. And if we get lots of current through, it'll go faster. If we only get a small amount of current through, it will go slower. And quite often we put a rheostat, which is a high powered variable resistor. So it's a variable resistor, but it actually has to dissipate some energy. So it tends to be of a high wattage, normally 10, 15, 20 watts, even for a small motor. So let's have a look at the torque and speed characteristics. First, torque and armature current. Armature current on the horizontal, torque on the vertical, and as you can see, as the current increases on the armature, so the torque or the force out on the shaft increases. So the more current you can put through the armature, the higher current you will have. Also, it will vary the speed. So now let's look at the speed, RPM of the motor. So at lightly loaded or no load, we're here and it's doing a certain speed in RPM. As we begin to load up the motor, here we are loading up the motor, more and more load. The speed is starting to drop off a little bit because of the interaction between the rotating magnetic field of the armature and the fixed field of the sh field and eventually we get to full load current here and the voltage you can see has slowly the armature current sorry has slowly started to drop off and the rpm is dropping away and if we keep loading the motor up It'll try to draw more current, but it won't be available, and the speed will just continue to descend like that until eventually the motor stalls. So you can eventually stall the motor, bring it to a mechanical stop, even though you're pumping energy into it. So the trick here is with fixed magnet motors, you can't control the torque. The torque is relatable to speed, and so as the speed diminishes, so also the torque. But what about a separately excited DC motor where we've got the field as a separate entity? That's nice and handy. Again, we've got a DC supply from somewhere. We're using a big variable resistor to vary the current through the field here. And it's our field. If we've got lots of current here, then we're going to get lots of flux across our armature. But if we've only got a small amount of current, then of course we're going to only end up with a small amount of field, which I'll represent by dotted lines. And then we apply our DC to our motor and away it goes. 
if we give it a lot of current it will rotate quickly and we can get a fair amount of torque if we vary the field we can vary the speed of the motor in actual fact we can vary the speed of the motor through the armature current so that's this one here IA or we can vary it through IF but IF has the bigger impact on speed so often we use IF to control speed and IA to control torque so a separately excited DC motor has the advantage of being able to control speed and torque with a combination of the current through the field and the current through the armature. A shunt DC motor now. now. All we're saying here is it's still got an electrically energized field, but we're putting that field in shunt or in parallel. That's what shunt means. Shunt's just another way of saying in parallel. So here we have a field resistor so we can control the amount of current through our field and therefore the amount of magnetic flux across the motor. We have a supply and current through the armature. So in this particular case, our supply is supplying current in the armature it's supplying IA and it's also supplying IF in the field. So how does that work in the motor itself? Let's have a look. Here's our supply, plus or minus supply. And let's trace it up through the field first. So we go up through the field into the north pole. It's just a big coil of wire back out again through a wire down to another coil which forms the south pole out again and back to the motor terminals these are the motor terminals and that's it that's that circuit that we just described through there except in this case we don't have a rear stat installed here somewhere next the armature, so here's the armature, we're coming through the armature, down through the brushes, onto the commutator. The commutator connects to the field, the field back to the commutator, back into one of the brushes, or the opposite brush, and back to the motor terminals. So we've just described this part of the circuit. So a shunt DC motor, by controlling the DC supply here, and by adding a rear stat to control field current, we can control speed with the field, but we can't control torque. So let's move on to the next one. Oh, before we do, <laughs> Let's look at the speed torque characteristics. And what do you notice about these? They're almost identical to the permanent magnet. As armature current increases, so too does the torque. So as the armature current increases, you get more torque, but also you get more speed. A speed characteristic at no load, you're a little bit over full load speed. But as you can see, as the load increases and the armature current increases, therefore the speed just drops off a tiny bit until eventually you get full load. And then after that, you're going to eventually descend to a stall if you're not careful. So the torque characteristics of the permanent magnet and the shunt field are very, very similar. So next is our series DC motor. So here with the same motor again, let's trace through the series arrangement. So basically we have an armature. 
the commutator, our brushes, we have a field, and then our motor terminals. So basically everything is literally in series. So the magnetic field that's being provided across the armature from the field is also the current that's going through the armature that's producing the interacting magnetic field. So there's an interplay between both currents and both fields, not only to create rotational force, but it will also affect the way the torque of the motor operates. So let's trace it through here on our connection diagram. So we're coming in from the minus on this particular occasion through to our north field, then through to our southern field, just a big coil of wire, comes back. Now it's feeding into the brush on the armature, into the armature, from the armature into the winding, from the winding back onto the armature, armature into the brush, and then back into the motor terminal. So basically everything is in series. So this is a has two pole series motor connections. You can use a diverter rheostat in the circuit to divert some current around. So if you just want to get a little bit of speed control, you can actually put a rheostat in here. They call it a diverter because you're effectively putting it in parallel around the field and we can divert some of the current around this way and therefore manage the field. But it's not typically used. Yeah. So look at the characteristics now. Very, very different. So with a series motor, it's not linear anymore. As the current for the armature increases, you do get an increase in torque. And for the first part of the curve, for a small increase in armature current, you get a decent increase in torque. In the middle of the curve, you're getting less. So I've done a We've almost doubled the current, but we certainly only increased the torque by a third. Here we double the current again, but we've probably only increased the torque by a half. So we have this squared relationship or what they call a logarithmic relationship, which causes this curved graph for our torque characteristic. That being the case, because the fields are interacting with each other, look at the speed characteristic. There's no such thing as a constant fixed speed. At no load, here is your speed, quite high, starts at full speed. And as the load increases, the speed just decays and decays and decays and decays and decays until eventually you will stall the motor. So all our other graphs, they were lovely, they kind of did this, dropped off a little bit, but you got constant speed. So in a series wound motor, you're going to get a logarithmic effect on the torque it's going to increase, but very, very slowly. And the motor speed is always going to decrease as load increases. So our speed goes down as our armature current goes up and our load goes up. And of course, we now come to the compound motor, which kind of mixes the best of both worlds both the series and the series and the shunt 
So here's our supply, here's our DC supply out here. We've got two field coils. So we've got a field coil segment, which is this one here, that's in shunt or parallel. And with the rear stat here, I can control the current through this part of the field. Try to draw an F, not doing too well. And then we've got another part of the field coil, which is also in series with the armature back to the supply. So here's our plus terminal down here and our minus terminal here. So let's quickly work our way through the diagram. So let's do the field first. The field is the blue one. So we're going to go from the supply plus through our S or our south pole then make a coil through the North Pole and then out to there. Then we're going to come back. Sorry. I'll just start that again because I, I missed my colouring. chasing the green ones so through the S south up and through north I'm still chasing the green one and not the blue one even though I said to do the blue one didn't I try again for the third time plus chasing the blue one we go in around through the south pole following our blue wire around create a north pole back out and back to there and there's our DC supply so we've chased through our parallel so that's the the blue wire now let's chase through the green one. So we're going through the green one. It's also forming part of the South Pole. Then coming up here, it's also forming part of the North Pole. It's coming out to a terminal, connecting and coming back in. And now, look, it's coming through the brushes onto the commutator from the commutator into the armature, round through the armature, back onto the commutator, back on the other brush, and then back out and back to our negative supply. So we've just described this part of the circuit. So the blue wire was the path of the shunt and the green wire green was the path of the series component so we've connected both together in the one motor so torque and speed curve characteristics now and we're comparing shunt series and compound So the shunt's the blue one, series is the green one, compound is the orange. So you can see the shunt gives you a perfectly, perfectly straight line up the blue one. The series was this horrendous curve. And of course the compound, look at him in the middle. He kind of gives you the best of both worlds in that sense as far as torque goes. So you can get a reasonably even torque 
and you're away. Now, let's look at B, the RPM versus the load. So here's our RPM on the horizontal, on the vertical, I should say, and armature current. The series, pretty poor performance, if you remember. The shunt or the, and the permanent magnet, great performance. The compound obviously gives you somewhere in the middle, somewhere about halfway as far as characteristics are concerned. So the characteristics or the using of a compound motor, unless you have a very, very special application, we tend to use either a series or a shunt because they're relatively easy to make. So let's sum up. Permanent magnet motors produce a linear torque and have good speed regulation. Separately excited DC motors require an external DC supply to provide that field current, but they also produce linear torque and have good speed regulation. A shunt DC motor has a good load speed regulation and its speed is readily controlled by varying the current to the shunt field coils, nice and easy. If the field current is too low, the motor speed can become excessive. So you've got to be a bit careful there. The series motor has a high starting torque, but can reach a dangerously high speed if unloaded. So series motors should never ever leave them unloaded because they will reach horrendously high speeds. A cumulatively compounded DC motor has a series and a shunt field coils connected to the magnetic fields to add to each other. The characteristic of the motor depends on the relative strength of the series and the shunt fields together combined. Typically a compound motor has a high starting torque due to the series winding and an acceptable no load speed regulation because of the shunt. So if you're looking for a motor that's got to have high torque at start and maintain good speed regulation, then you're going to go a compound motor. But if you're not worried about uh, the torque requirements at start, and you're happy to have high torque at, high, at uh, load speed, then the shunt motor is the way to go. All DC motors exhibit maximum torque at startup or at zero speed. That's when you're going to get the maximum oomph out of them. A DC motor will run in reverse if the polarity of the field coils or the armature terminals are reversed, but not both. So now we're into losses. So we're now to section 14.4, loss and efficiency. So this little diagram we're simply looking at the amount of energy put in to the amount of mechanical energy we get out at the other end. And we have losses along the way. The typical losses are we lose energy because of friction. And that friction can be friction in the bearings and it can be friction in the fan or what they call the windage that moves cool air through the motor, keep it cool. So all of those things we call friction and they create a fair amount of loss. So that's bearings. Bearings and fans. Iron losses is the next one. Both the armature and the stator of a DC motor are made up of silicon steel. And as we magnetize them in one direction and then demagnetize them in the other direction, we get this hysteresis effect. And that creates a thing called iron losses here in the middle. And they get warm because we're just flicking the electrons and the 
the molecules backwards and forwards, creating this hysteresis curve. If we magnetized up perfectly in one direction and reverse magnetized in the other direction like that, then we would have no iron losses. But because we magnetize up with this gap of magnetizing up in one direction, but not all the molecules change back the other way and vice versa, we end up with the gap. And that's called hysteresis, and that's the crux of our iron losses. All DC motors are made up of copper windings, and those copper windings have internal resistance, and those internal resistances absorb a little bit of energy. And because the windings are made of copper, we call them the copper losses. So it's the current through the winding caused by the R, the resistance, produces energy, which more often than not gets expelled as heat. So you get radiate heat from that. And then finally, the rotating magnetic field turns the armature and you get mechanical output out of here as well. So we put a certain amount of electrical energy in, but some of that electrical energy is going to be absorbed in friction and we're going to lose it. Some of it's going to be absorbed in iron losses and magnetizing curves of the machine and some of it's going to be lost in the resistance of the copper and whatever's left over turns into magnetic field and that's what causes a rotation and gives us our mechanical power out. Nothing like a little example to demonstrate this. So we have a motor delivering a torque of 70 Newton meters and at a speed of 1400 RPM while taking a current of 30 amps from a 400 volt supply. Calculate one, the motor power, two, the output power and the losses. So here's all the stuff the question has given us and here's the things we need to find out. So the first thing, equation we need is power is the volts times the amps. In DC, power equals VI. So we simply take our 400, multiply it by our 30, so that's 400 volts multiplied by 30 amps, giving us, we're putting in a whole 12 kilowatts. Power out, the equation we need for power out is 2 pi nt on 60. So 2 pi is the constants, n is the number of turns, and T is the motor torque, all divided by 60, because we're going to put that in an RPM. We can simplify all of that formula down to this one, NT divided by 9.5. All we're doing is simplifying all those constants into a single number. So we're going to take our 70, our Newton meters, our force multiplied by T, our speed at 1400 and divided by 9.55, telling us we have an output power of 10.26 kilowatts. Next, our losses are reasonably straightforward because that's simply the amount of power in and you subtract the amount of power out. So in this particular case, we had 12 kilowatts in came from there there it is there and we have power out here so 12 minus 10.26 gives us we're many we're losing 1.74 kilowatts that's a fair amount of grunt being lost as efficiency losses inside the machine So we often want to think about it in terms of efficiency. 
So the efficiency of a DC mount is found the same way as for a DC generator or anything in actual fact. That is by dividing the power by the output and multiplying by 100 on 1. So we use the efficiency, use the symbol mu, and we normally just use a lowercase n, even though it's got a long tail. So the percent efficiency is simply the power out divided by the power in multiplied by 100 on 1. So remember the power out will always be smaller than the power in, so if you can never remember it, it's always going to be the little one on top of the big one multiplied by 100 to simply put it into a percentage. That's all we're doing. So here's a quick little example. Find the efficiency of a 250 volt 15 kilowatt DC motor that uh, is taking a full load current of 70 amps. So we're going to need to find out the efficiency. They've told us the power out and they've kind of told us the power in but not directly. So by using this information here we can determine the power in because we know that power equals the current multiplied by the voltage. And that's what we're doing here. So I take our 250 multiplied by 70 and we get 17.5 kilowatts. So we take our 15, which is our power out. We put it on top of our power in, giving a ratio, and then we multiply that ratio by 100. And it tells us that our motor, in this particular case, is 87.7% efficient. So these are what we call efficiency curves. So efficiency of a DC motor can be compared to speed and torque. So on the horizontal, we've got torque in Newton meters. In other words, how hard the shaft is being turned by the rotating magnetic field in your motor. So at rated torque here, this is where you want to get your maximum amount of torque and down here is what they call stall torque so rated torque is normally happening at rated speed so this is normally happening at the rated speed and your stall torque is we've put so much load on it you've brought the motor to a standstill so at start, when a motor starts, of course, it's standing still, it's at stall. So you get your maximum amount of current, your start current, here. So lots and lots of current. So your current, as your motor starts, and then as it starts to load up, your current drops off to here. And there's your rated torque and your rated amount of current. If you don't put any load on your motor, then of course your torque drops right off until you only have just enough torque in your motor to turn the fan and the armature itself. If you look at it from now a speed perspective, so here is speed, the blue curve is speed. When we start the machine at stall from it where it's starting, we have no speed, but as the machine speeds up and the torque increases, it crosses over there until if you have no load on it, its speed will continue to just increase until you hit the thing called no load speed. So you'll notice these things to cross over here and they cross over, not by accident, close to the rated torque position.
because you want to get your best speed and your best torque close to your rated torque as close as you can if you can get them to cross right over on each other you'd have the perfect motor then let's look at the third curve now let's go from left to right at full speed and no load our efficiency is very poor then as our motor speeds up and increases its load its efficiency improves it gets better and gets better and gets better and gets better and it starts to peak out about here just before it gets to rated torque there's our rated torque then as the motor loads up and gets fully to rated torque its efficiency is dropped off a little bit and then if you go over rated torque in other words you're overloading your motor you've got too much mechanical load on it eventually the efficiency of the motor will drop to zero once it stalls so we want this efficiency to happen as close as we can to rated torque so here are the two critical points this one here torque and sp and speed and we also want maximum efficiency here here's maximum efficiency so here's the Goldilocks zone in here unfortunately we can never get efficiency perfectly on top of the perfect speed torque position so this is the this is the perfect speed torque ST at this position this is the perfect efficiency at this position so you'll notice our rated torque and speed is actually somewhere here in the middle that's the reality that's it here in the middle so that's why the efficiency curves are important we want to achieve maximum efficiency but we also want to achieve maximum torque and output of our motor at the maximum or the correct speed so that brings us to the end of electromagnetism uh, lesson number 10 I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit about DC magnets it's DC magnets DC motors and their different characteristics how they're wired how they're connected and how they perform